I want us to look this morning in the book of, of the Revelation chapter 2. I am kind of feeding off of the last week. Just a, a, a message I'm meditating on in the beginning part of this year in my own life filtering through. And I pray it, it matters to you as well. It means something to you as well. We were talking about how Jesus kept right on growing. He kept right on advancing. How I firmly believe that's what we need to do. If we ever stop growing, there's, there's only one choice for us, and that's dying. I don't want to die. Uh, I pass from death to life. Death is not supposed to be a part of my life anymore. It's supposed to be part of this physicality. It's supposed to be part of this world. But I have passed. I have gone past that. So I should feel that way. But it's easy, it's easy to get comfortable in this world and to settle for less. But he kept right on growing. But he grew in favor with God. That's, that's what's on my heart today. Growing in favor yes. with God. Because yes. I'm afraid some people think when I gave God my heart, when I got to say, that's enough for Him for life. No. Now, they don't say that. I agree they don't say that, but that's how they act. Because that's all they ever need to give Him. They have no responsibility to Him. And, and I, 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 my own heart is, is plucked by how much have you uh, given to the Lord that you're growing in favor with Him. Not do I like Him more, but does He like what's going on in my life? You see that? There's, there's the judge. There's the standard. Is He happy with me? Not am I happy with Him. He's still Creator, whether I like Him or whether I don't. He's still God, whether I worship Him or whether I don't. I, I cannot change His status whatsoever. But if I acknowledge Him, what I want is I want to grow in favor with Him. I want to grow in that. And I tell you, I can't grow on what I had when I was first saved. I can't. It, it's gone. I can't grow on what I had last year, church. It's not enough. Because Jesus don't do leftovers. He serves it fresh every day. And if you don't take it, then you can starve. Because He serves it. And He wants this for us. He desires this for us. So I want to just follow my life like Jesus did. I want to grow in favor with God. And I want to do it. Every day of my life. But I thought, Lord, there's so much in there. So many things in the New Testament to, to, to cover this. I mean, everything is good in there. and Everything we need. But I, I, I heard him speak so clear to me. He says, you know, we don't start where Jesus did. You understand that? You see, Jesus didn't have a sinful heart. He didn't have a rebellious heart. He wasn't rebellious. When he grew in God, it's just a continuation of his relationship and it's unimpeded and, and, and he had such power and such intimacy with God. That's not where I start. I start with a rebellious heart. I start with a selfish heart. I start with, a, with a, a heart that God has to, by his grace, mold and transform into the image of Christ. Yeah. And the world is against you. The world is saying, listen to your sinful heart. Obey your sinful heart. And unfortunately, the church listens. Oh, me right there. The church listens. How do you know they listen? Well, I go to Revelation chapter 2. And it says in this chapter that Jesus is walking amongst His churches. He's watching them. Who knew Jesus was actually concerned about the church that He birthed? He is still concern about the church that was birthed on the day of Pentecost. And as we look at these, I pointed out to you just a couple weeks ago, there was two churches that were in the midst of the, I mean, they were going through tough times, but he said, don't look at it. Don't look at the stuff. Don't look at it. You're faithful and you will be rewarded. But that was two. You know how many churches he talked to? Seven. So that means five had some issues. What were the issues? Were the issues that they were not listening to God, that, that they were not obedient to God, or that God was not speaking to them and working in them? I fully believe God was walking in the midst of His churches as the picture is given to us. But they lost some things along the way. And I want to focus on three of these things. I want to focus on Pergamos, Thyatira, and then Ephesus. Out of order as far as the, the biblical record is, but I want to, I want to do it um, intentionally. So focus with me on Revelation chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, and then verse 20, and I will read uh, 2, 4, and 5 a little bit later. In Pergamos, he says, I have a few things against you. Now, I don't want to belabor this point, but when Jesus says, I have a problem, that ought to take note. That's like headline news right there. 
That's like first page. That's not fourth page buried under the classifieds. That's like headline news. I have some issues. I have some problems. There are some, some issues against you. It says, there are those you have in your midst, in the church, those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Another emphasized word. God hates something. You better take it. You better pay attention to that emotion of God. In verse 20, we go to Thyatira. And he says, this, almost the same words here, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now these things that I, I want to point out to you is not any way to say this is what the 96 church is because that's what I'm talking about today. But they reveal a hostile world in the first century. Does anybody think it's gotten kinder and gentler to us in 2,000 years? So if the world is against us and the world is having impact, I think we ought to see where their impact lies and stop it. Because we don't want to please them. Lord, please. So let's pray about being in favor with God. Father, I ask you to speak to us today as we embark on 2020. Father, I don't want to waste a month. I don't want to really waste a day, my Father. I want to be where you want me to be. I want what you want. I desire the things of God. I desire for you to mold and make me after, after that perfect example, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, it's not enough to put it in second place. God, I want it to come to the first of the list, top priority, number one in my life. I want to be in favor with my God. And Lord Jesus, I ask, for you to aid me by your spirit. I ask you to aid these your children by your spirit. Because the world is a dangerous anti-God place. I want the church to be different. Not because of my desires. But because of your desires. So guard us, protect us, and teach us. That, oh Father, we may be in the pattern you want us to be. And have the character that you desire for us to have. This we pray. This we plead, dear God of your grace. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Pergamum, Thyatira. Churches of God. Doing work in this world. Little lighthouses of good, you would say, in the midst of an evil Roman Empire. And Jesus said, I'm not going to grade you on a bell curve. I'm not going to say, well, you're better than most. I'm going to tell you where your good parts are. And he did. But I'm also going to tell you the things that I have a problem with. And the reason why I highlight this to you today, church, is because I want us to be aware of what's going on in this world. I'm not here to browbeat you or, or browbeat anybody because what's the point of that? But when Jesus says these are serious things, then I take them as serious. And what he says basically to these two churches is you're holding things you ought not hold on to. And you are allowing things that you ought not allow. And basically, what are these things? I mean, if you read it, it's not really very complicated. He says you are allowing the culture to infiltrate your community. Uh, was there sexual immorality in the Roman Empire? Have you read a history book like that? <laughs> It was a horrible place. It was very, very immoral because the gods were immoral. And so they didn't care and you were at their mercy. They didn't care either. Your power and your privilege meant everything. And were they, were they a people that, that held to, to the idolatry and that's all that really matters? Yes, make your sacrifice to the emperor. Make it to this god, to that god. Yes, appease them all and then live how you want to. Yes, that was their life. But Jesus is not talking to Roman citizens. Jesus is not talking to Roman communities. Jesus is talking to his church. He said, I brought you out of this. I died that you may be delivered from the way this world works. I saved you. I cleansed you. I washed you. I made you white in my own precious blood that was sufficient for your sins. So I know this culture and I don't want you to be a part of this culture. It 
It's something that's always faced the people of God. It's a danger that has been true even from the earliest books of the Bible. And so I think it is a, it is a situation that we must be aware of. He, whole, he says he describes it in this way. We don't know the ins and outs of the exact uh, cultural impact that it was having, but it was very much tied to the doctrine of Balaam. The Balaam that said, I can't curse the people of God, so I'll tell you how to trip them up. I'll tell you how to get them out of sorts with God. And I'll tell you how you do it. Appeal to their flesh. And they'll leave God by the wayside. Well, he's an idiot, what? These are people of God. These are people that came out of Egypt. They crossed through the Red Sea. They saw manna come down from heaven. They saw fire on the mountain. There's no way on creation that, that, that a few fleshly temptations is going to move these people. Well, it sure did. They went off after those idols. They chased after those foreign women. And it wasn't the wild foreign women was the problem. It was what they was getting them to do that was the problem. They forsook their God for the pleasure of the moment. God had to straighten that out. And it was a great stumbling block to the children of Israel so long that even at the last book of the Bible, he says in the Roman Empire, in the church of this day, you've got some that are basically making a covenant, basically compromising with the world. They're allowing this belief system to be in the midst of the church. He also describes it having the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which has been lost to history, exactly what that was. But it was believed that it was followers of Nicholas, who was maybe a deacon, maybe a follower in this church of some sort, but he was he, he got to have so much influence, he said, this is going to be the church of Nicholas. This is going to be my way. Have you ever heard that before? <laughs> the church of my way, the church of the way I want it to be. And these issues are very contemporary. I, I think about how have perhaps we, in the 20th, 21st century now, how have we perhaps married ourselves to the, the, the world's way of doing things. And, and there's a lot of things I could bring up, but one that really came to the forefront that I thought was pretty easy to mention is um, anytime you add anything to the Word of God, that's a little bit of compromise, isn't it? I think about denominationalism. Can you find that for me in the Bible? Can you find me where there should be a thousand different churches of a thousand different stripes? All over the world, each one arguing with the other, who was the real, real church of God? As I read my Bible, Jesus said, I have but one body. I have but one people. I have but one church. And I thank God. God has been at work. Because this is the rancor between that used to be a lot worse than it was. Oh, it was, wasn't it? Oh, we all knew how it felt. People went down the street. Oh, they were heathen. Oh, yeah, they were church. They were heathen anyway. I don't care. They were heathen because if we had the list of the reasons why they were, God's wiped a lot of that away. He's done a lot of that. In fact, I told the pastor in Lawrence before I left there, I said, you know what? We ought to, we ought to somehow, I don't know how in the world it would ever work because we've moved so far from it. We ought to be in the same church, working for the same goal, serving the same Jesus. It's just the way it ought to be because I just don't see a stand in heaven for the Pentecostals and a stand in heaven for the Presbyterians and a stand in heaven for, for whatever denomination or whatever creed that you want to say. I just see every tongue, every tribe, every nation gathered around the throne indiscriminately giving praise to God. So that means God is going to have to undo the compromises that we have made in this life. Now, can I say that all division and all denominations, the reason why they have them are bad, I can't say that. But I don't think I don't think it ever is truly godly in some regards. Doctrine is important. He says you hold on to the wrong thing. Sometimes we've had to split because of that and unfortunately it's happening even today. The United Methodist Church is no longer united anymore. And we're not talking about that because it hits a little close to home, don't it? Doesn't it? I mean our tradition came out of their tradition. Didn't that holiness movement I mean, it hits a little bit close to home. They're not united anymore. Say it what it is. They are dividing, and they're dividing over the doctrine. Yeah. Did you ever think about that? Did you ever realize that a mainline church that says we follow God and believe the Bible, they've split over doctrine, over the belief in the Word of God. And that fortunately has been going on. It's not a new incident. And those who have been in their church a while, they would know. But I, I saw someone not of our faith tradition, but they were commenting on this from kind of an outside perspective, a, a European perspective more of, and I realize that they're 
or uh, Methodists are in Europe as well, all over the world, in fact. But it was interesting, his take on it, uh, different than my perspective. He says, it's kind of odd that this issue, uh, same-sex marriage, has, has been the, the point of division that has caused this. He says the, the, the revolution that we had back in the 70s was but a symptom of the selfhood revolution. Now that's, I think that's a pretty good way. Let's go ahead and rename it. Let's not call it the, the, the revolution that happened in the 70s. Let's call it the selfhood revolution because that's what it really gets down to. Whereby expressive individualism came to dominate how our culture understands the purpose of life. He says whether they've done it intentionally or whether by cultural osmosis, the divisive debate has gotten to this point because of factors that have been going on long before now. It means it, means it is a church where significant parties have already abandoned basic Christian anthropology and an orthodox understanding of biblical authority. Not for probably any of the people you know, but this church has struggled over where Jesus rose from the dead or not. They have I can take you to websites and some, some in good standing still say, you know, we kind of don't know. Was Jesus, was, was Jesus born of a virgin? Ah, well, that could be interpreted different ways. Everything you say, they have a reason and answer. That's not really what it says. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? This has been happening and the more conservatives that we have around here don't know about it, but you've seen it recently. You've seen it in the headlines. It is a very divisive thing and it's happening. And I wanted to, on the other side, talk about one who was a part of the movement. And they said, as a United Methodist, this is a nightmare from which there is no awakening without a great awakening. Good words. The dullness and despair and darkness of our moment stifle meaningful response. How is it thinkable that the church of Wesleyan scriptural holiness reverses itself on historic Christian essentials? This is treason. This is corruption of both head and heart. A dethroning exchange in which truth is swapped for falsehood. I mourn, I mourn the division of God's church. Amen. Amen. It bothers me. It, it, it doesn't make me joyful in any way, shape, or form. I want the world divided, but I want the church united. I want us under one person because that's what my Jesus prayed for. He didn't pray. I pray there are a thousand different factions fighting with each other. I pray they are one, Jesus said, even as we are one, that they may know what we have and they may see what's coming for them. That's what I want them to know. And that's the passion that burns in my heart. But the world wants us to compromise with the cultural setting of our day and their pressure is being applied. And I'm sad to say, if you saw in the past couple of weeks, it takes, it takes a sinner to point out Hollywood's lack of influence, or their supposed lack of influence. He said during their own award show, you shouldn't tell anything about anything. What do you know about anybody's life? But their influence is great. And it's even greater than the church. So we must be aware of that. We must be aware, and Jesus says, you have... You hold on to these things. Is there hope beyond that? Absolutely there's hope. But you better know where the battle is. Because while we're twiddling our thumbs, the devil is on his business. And he's working as hard as he can. You play with him. And you will be run over by him. This is our world. And this is what Jesus was concerned about even in the first century. But wait, that's doctrine. Doctrine seems to be kind of our over our head. But Thyatira had the exact same situation, except rather in their, what they held on to doctrine-wise, it was a compromise in spirituality. All they needed was this Jezebel, as it's described, person of the Old Testament who had great influence and great power and manipulated things according to their way. He described her in that way, and he says she's supposedly a prophetess. So basically she comes along and says, Thus says the Lord. And of course, that's what you got to follow. And so, guess where it ends up? Well, as I read it, Jesus says they're committing sexual immorality and they're eating things sacrificed to idols. So we've ended up in the exact same place as the other church, but it's, it's different now. It's not doctrine, it's spirituality. Well, this is a prophetess. Well, this is a person speaking for God. You ever heard somebody tell you, <laughs> I have heard from God and this is what you need to do? 
why can't God talk to you? <laughs> I mean, God not got an open line of communication to you? Or, or you're in rebellion? I fully believe God speaks, and I believe God speaks prophetically to His people. I am not talking about that at all. But I'm saying, what happened in this church was this woman was saying this is of God, but it's not of God at all. And it's not, it's not, just, it's not just the Methodist church that are struggling. We've got people in our own denomination that are fighting over land just up the street in Greenville. Fighting over land. Land. This is not my home, I thought it was. This is the, I'm just passing through, the song said. So it's here. The influence is here. It, 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 is, it is pervasive. And we have to say, no. We have to say, I'm not going to allow those influences. I'm not going to allow those things to affect me. We've got to lift up a standard and say, this doesn't belong in my life. And it must be answered from us. That influence must be diminished in our lives and His influence must increase in us. This is what He's asking for here. This is the turnaround. You've got somebody in your midst that you're allowing to do these things. The simple thing is, move that influence out and let my influence take center stage once again. But as I see where we stand, how impactful is the influence of Jesus Christ? How much does He impact us beyond the feeling that we have? What are we seeking for? What are we longing for? I, I heard Brother Steve this morning share with us in the men's breakfast that he's longing to see the glory of God in his life. That's a passion. That's a longing. Guess who asked that first? Moses asked that. He saw a little bit of God's glory and he says, that's not enough. I want some more. On Friday morning, I was at another prayer breakfast and guess what the message was on? We need to not just have the presence of God, we need to have an encounter with God. We just need to see Him. We need to let Him change our lives and then maybe we'll be at His feet again. Maybe we'll spend hours in His presence again. Maybe we'll long to be in Him rather than to be away from Him. When His influence is great, we are there where He is. When His influence is minor, it doesn't matter. Influences. I've been a sports fan all my life. Baseball, soccer's not a sport. I'm sorry. I'm stupid. <laughs> It'll turn my nose up at European sport. Football, especially. It's complicated, though, the older I get. I always have my, my Liz, Liz uncle told me he was, he was, a, he was a, a season ticket holder for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I said, Man, you get to go to everyone. I asked him one time, I said, you, you go on Steelers? He said, no. Why not? I mean, you live right here in Pittsburgh. Why not? He says, man, the taxes we have to pay so they can have that glorified thing up there and pay them millions of dollars to them overpriced people. And I'm, not, I'm just not willing to do that anymore. I mean, it kind of shattered my world. But yeah, I understand that, but it's, it's football. It's football, you know? And it's, so that kind of kind of put a little crack in, in my screen. And, and the, the longer I begin to live, I begin to, I begin to see the influence of you got to see this and it's the must-see time and the must-see that. It's beginning to wane in its influence in my life because I have, I have things. i got a team that I, that I pull for. But when that team decides that, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to help other people kill their babies, it's kind of hard for me to say, rah, 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 that's... That's what I'm pulling for when the, when the quarterback says, you know what? I kind of don't like the God who's going to kill thousands of people in this world that don't believe in Him. So I'm just looking for something else. It probably doesn't hurt. He's living with his girlfriend in that million dollar mansion. It probably has a little effect on it. But, you know, go team. Who, who, who am I pulling for? What, what am I rooting for? When, when, when I look at, and I was teaching out of a book for the kids, I was, I was doing it the other day. I read the front cover, and, and, and I see in the front cover a uh, Kirk Cousins. Vikings. He's talking about how influential this is for his kids, and he wants them to grow in God. I'm thinking, oh man, he is a Christian, and so, but he's for the team, and I'm not supposed to like. And, mm, and then I see Drew Brees, and I'm not a Saints fan, but Drew Brees comes out and says, you know, we ought to bring our Bibles to church, to, to school. We ought to read our Bibles, and he was maligned for that. Oh, how horrible it was! But it's kind of hard not to say, man, go, Drew, go preach, go do it. It becomes complicated, doesn't it? Because it's no longer just a fantasy. It's no longer just, just neutral. It's influence. And that influence is preaching something. That influence is trying to get me to think a certain way. But my Bible says that Jesus comes first. That He is the, the way, the truth, and the life. So it hinders that influence. And it says, who is? Who is? 
The number one in your. Who's the number one team? Who you going to raise that first finger for? It ought to be for the church of Jesus Christ. It ought to be for Jesus the Lord. Above everything else. I'm not trying to claim it's, it's all of the devil. There's good people doing good work there. But he says influence. is causing them to teach and seduce my student. And my my uh, servants to committing things that are of the culture of this world. We ought to be aware of that. But it all comes down to really, I couldn't get away from it. It comes down to Ephesus, doesn't it? Because everything I began to read about, you could, you could sum it all up in what he wrote to the book of Ephesus. And you've heard it many, many times before. He says in verse 4, Ephesus, man, you've got a lot of good things going on, but I have something against you. It's not your doctrine. It's not your influence. It's just you don't love me like you used to. He calls it first love. The love that they had at first. The love that was an exciting one. The love where they were glad to be away from their sin and in His presence. They were glad to be forgiven. And all their work, all their work that they did was out of that joy. It was out of that gladness. It was out of that excitement. They were so glad to be the people of God, worshiping God. He says, you're still doing the work. You're still very active. But you're not really loving them. I'm just not first. He says, you can hear, you can hear the tenderness in his words. Remember from where you fall. We had something special going. Yeah, and you fell from it. It was a high place. It was a good place. It was a wondrous place. It reminds me of, of my growing up. And a lot of you growing up too. Where an hour? Man, it's only been an hour? An evening? Huh. I don't care if I get home. We'll, we'll go out to Burger King at 11 o'clock tonight. Well, I don't care. Winston, I can't wait to get there. Revival, man, man, man. I'm there every night. And we don't remember all the revival speakers. We don't remember all the sermons. We do remember Jesus was there. We do remember it was special. We do remember it was, it was like He was right there. Some people said He was so close, it was foggy in the place. He was so close, I didn't want to move. I didn't want to speak. I didn't want to break that connection in that moment. It was so special when I walked out. I, I was so sensitive to everything I did because I don't care that whoever was looking at me, I don't care what it looked like in my home. I didn't want to offend him. I wanted to take that presence with me everywhere. I wanted it to be close to me everywhere. And when I come back to church the next time, I wasn't expecting a dead, dry bar. And my hands were up in the air and I'm saying, okay, what's God going to do this week? How is He going to touch? Who's going to be at the altar this week? Because there were some people that was just in love with Jesus. They didn't know all the doctrine. They didn't know all the... They hadn't memorized it from cover to cover. But they did know Him. And they had touched Him. And they didn't want to move away from Him. And nothing in this world matters. They'd throw down bottles. They'd throw down packs of cigarettes. Whatever it took to get close to Him, they would do it. Because there was nothing in their lives that meant more to them than He did in that moment. Now I ask, where did Jesus go? He hasn't moved. So as that squeezes my heart, it tells me something very loudly. I'm looking up at Him. Because I've come down from that place we used to be. I'm not saying life is always the same. There's tough times in life. There's difficult times in life. But I just read... I was just, the book I'm reading right now is about a, a saint of God that I really appreciated. It's called Dallas Willard. He passed away, I believe it was last year. And the guy who was helping him write this book, he tried to get it done before he died. I mean, they were working hard, but his, his prostate cancer was working on him. And it was, it, was, it was a touch and go. He finally spent the last week of his life together, not, not working on the book, 
just caring for this man and his family for that very difficult time. And he had to finish up a little bit of it at the end. But he said, I want to tell you about this man Dallas Willard at the end of his life. He says, being with him was like he had just stepped away from the presence of Jesus and was talking to me. It's like, it's like he was there. And just being around him made me feel closer to him. And he said, as he, as he went into heaven, that influence remained. I don't know about how you want to leave this life. That sounds really attractive to me. It sounds like to me, I want people to catch the distinct fragrance of Christ when they're around the life of Christ. The more they forget about me, and the more they sense Him, the happier I will be. Because Jesus said, Jesus said, I want that, what we had together. First love. First time. I want, I want it to be when my words mattered to you. When my closeness mattered to you. When you longed for me more than your next week. I tell you, it's coming for people. Can I tell you? I, I, the youth, have been, they've, been, they've been embarking on a fast to seek the Lord. God bless them. You pat them on the back, you said, go on with God. Watch my own daughter, because I didn't watch the others, but so many are giving, giving up different things for God. I, they've been doing that, and I appreciate that of our youth. I, mean, I, do, I truly do. It's been going on for a while. But I, I saw her struggle with, not what do I have to give up. But is this enough? Because if it's not really a sacrifice, I'm going to do it. If I could get by without it anyway, I'm not going to do it. She don't want to be a fake faster. She wants to be real. She wants it to mean something to her. She wants Jesus more than she wants what she's put on the altar. And I said, my child, go with God. Because even if you're, if you're adults around you, forget that. Oh, please, you grab a hold of God. You get a hold of what maybe we've left behind. Because I don't deserve to stand in your way. You get from God all that you want from God. And if you're the only one to go, then my child, you go it alone. You will never be sorry for giving your all to Him. Hallelujah. Would you stand and please bow your heads. Hallelujah.